Thanks, Torin. So I'd first like to thank Resources for hosting this event tonight. I really appreciate the space. Um, as Torin said, my name is Dylan Thompson. I am a co-founder and active board member of Fertile Ground. Fertile Ground promotes a worldwide oppositional culture to challenge the power structures that perpetuate systems of oppression and domination over human populations in the natural world. We do this by developing leadership that will build support for localized resistance against the destructive manifestations of industrial civilization. And I'm here this evening to talk to you about environmentalism in the 21st century, what it might look like and how it might differ from the activism of the past. And I'm going to jump right into it because I have a lot that I want to talk to you about. But let me preface my presentation by acknowledging that although you will hear me being critical of the activism of the past and of today, I recognize I would not be here if it wasn't for the vast body of activism that precedes me. This country has a rich activist history, and I feel privileged to have such a history as a foundation for my own work, which I see merely as my own addition to that legacy. So here we go. I'd like to begin tonight with an observation. If we go back to 1962, when Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring was published, and call that the beginning of the modern environmental movement, that means the modern environmental movement has existed for almost half a century. Almost 50 years of environmental activism, and yet, every living system is in decline. There hasn't been one peer-reviewed scientific article that's been published in the past 20 to 30 years that shows any living system that is stable or improving. An average of 120 species is driven extinct every day. Forests continue to be pulled down, grasslands continue to be ripped up, migratory songbird populations are collapsing, mollusk populations are collapsing, um, amphibian populations are collapsing, fish populations. Things are not getting better by any realistic measure. In fact, this guy, David Brower, um, sort of a big-time conservationist, um, who started the Sierra Club Foundation, the John Muir Institute for Environmental Studies, Friends of the Earth, the League of Conservation Voters, the Earth Island Institute, and several other organizations, was quoted before his death in 2000, having said, quote, all I did in my career was to slow the rate at which things are getting worse. All I did in my career was to slow the rate at which things are getting worse. And so this begs the question, why, despite the work of so many dedicated people, like David Brower, like Rachel Carson, like so many others, is the environmental movement failing? Why is it that our so-called victories are usually temporary and defensive, while the damage caused by this culture is usually permanent and offensive? There have been, and still are, so many people clinging by their fingernails to this or that patch of forest, this or that stream, this or that salmon run, while all it is doing in a big picture sense is making things slightly less worse. These are the questions I'm going to be exploring tonight in my presentation. First, though, I think it would be useful for me to give you a sense of where I'm coming from in all of this by telling you a quick story from my childhood. And it's a story about these beautiful creatures. I grew up near the tip of the Puget Sound um, between two very small rural towns. And the house I grew up in was situated on a hillside that overlooked a large meadow. And this meadow was home to many creatures. I remember seeing bobcats and deer and coyotes and I watched eagles and hawks dive for their meals of field mice. And there was a herd of elk that would come through occasionally to graze and socialize. Um, have any of you ever heard the bugling of elk? Yeah. Um, to this day, I think it's one of the most beautiful noises I've ever heard. And I remember one morning going outside to do some chores. And I was walking to the garage, and it was really, really foggy. I could barely see 20 to 30 feet ahead of me. And I heard this noise and I realized it was coming from the meadow. And I knew then that I was hearing the elk, and I think I was hearing mothers and their children calling back and forth to one another. And as I was standing there with a chill going up my spine, I was reminded in that instant of whale song, and it was one of the most beautiful memories that I have of growing up. And then in my mid-teens, that meadow was put up for sale, and some people bought it and pulled in a home and transformed the meadow into pasture for racing horses. They were in the racing horse business. Um, this was a huge transition that weighed very heavy on my spirit because I knew that it wasn't an isolated event. This singular human displacement of multiple non-human <coughs> communal elements wasn't just happening here. There were many times sitting in the car as my parents were driving that I would see new clear cuts where once there had been a forest, new shopping centers where once there had been a meadow, 
new parking lots, new high-density housing developments. I understood from a pretty young age that this is just what the dominant culture does. It expands into new territories, replacing non-human diversity with human hegemony while displacing or destroying community. And I knew that just from what I directly experienced as a child. By now, I've been able to find out just how this expansionistic culture manifests itself on more of a macro level. I've learned how, in its relentless expansion, it not only paves over meadows, pulls down forests, and liquidates biodiversity, but it also enslaves humans to do its work. And it drives indigenous people off their land. It drives entire human cultures extinct. Many people don't even realize that some of these vibrant, healthy land-based cultures are still with us. 150 million tribal people live in 60 countries across the world, and their entire worlds, their entire universes, are being destroyed by the expansion of this culture. Just to give you a few examples, there's the Yanomami of Brazil, who have lived in the rainforest and the mountains for thousands of years, and who are now being threatened with mining and ranching. There's the Dongri Akand, a gathering and hunting people who live in the mountains of India. They've been threatened by a British mining company called Vedanta, which wants to blow up their mountains so they can mine bauxite, which is then turned into aluminum. And there's the Anawa Ninawe, who also live in Brazil in the western rainforests, and who are being threatened by a huge dam project upriver, which would destroy their livelihoods as fishing and gathering people. My point with sharing all this with you is simply to illustrate that this problem is huge and extremely pervasive. And I think many of you here tonight are like me in that you understand the magnitude and the urgency of it, not only in your heads, but also in your bones. And because it is so huge, we need to be sure that as we discuss solutions and ways to move forward, that we're starting off on solid ground. We need to be sure that we're not just taking what capitalists should, should say we should do, buy green, recycle, etc., but that we really have a stable theoretical grounding so we know how to be most effective. And so the direction of this presentation is simple. I want to reintroduce the political element into the discussion of environmentalism and ecology. It is my general position that the majority of environmentalists lack a foundational understanding of the political, what it means, why it matters, and how it affects the work we do. As I hope will become clear throughout this presentation, if all environmentalists are to continue ignoring the political aspect of our work, we will be largely misguided and thus ineffective. And at this stage in the game, being ineffective is not an option, at least not for me. And I'm assuming the same is true for all of us in this room, which is why we're here tonight. So what is political? I'm not very interested in nailing the idea down to some narrow definition, because the concept is extremely broad. But for our purposes here, we can understand political as referring to a few key points. First, political refers to the process by which we as a society make decisions. Intimately wound up within this is the point that some individuals have more of a say in these decisions than others. And there's a name for this imbalance. It's called power. Some people have more power in this society than others. And generally, since the agricultural revolution onwards, that power has continued to be held by a smaller and smaller portion of the population. The second aspect of the political is the kinds of decisions that a society must make. How will resources be collected and distributed? Are we going to organize ourselves through agriculture or horticulture? Can an individual receive benefits from the overall work? if they're unable to contribute personally? These questions are political questions. Now when we talk about environmentalism and ecology, we're talking about our relationship to the living communities around us, how we want to situate ourselves within the larger biotic process. We know that we can only sustain our own lives through the complex interchange of resources and energy between our bodies and the rest of the world. So by definition, we see that these fields are eminently political. Now have you noticed anything about this discussion so far? we've in no way had to touch on bipartisan politics. So often the word politics is associated only with bipartisan issues, Democrats and Republicans. And my God, if, it was, if that was the only political sphere, then I wouldn't blame anyone for wanting to be apolitical. But it's not. In fact, I think bipartisan issues are more of a distraction away from the crucially political aspects of life today. Now I want to come back for a minute to the issue of power. An analysis of power is where most environmentalists and many progressives in general fall short. To really get at this, I'm going to move on to one of the strongest conceptual tools that I know of, the liberal radical distinction. I can't begin to explain how much time, how much wasted energy this chart has saved me. If you can really absorb this, you'll be light years ahead of other people, even those who have been doing environmental work for decades now. 
So I'm distinguishing here between two theories and practices of social change. And to clarify, I didn't make this up. This is a historically established division between in cultural uh, theory and social theory. But rather than defining each point at the outset, it's best to run through the differences between the two positions. And then it will make the most sense to you after I'm finished. I'll also be elaborating on this model throughout the rest of the presentation, giving historical examples when appropriate. Now the first point of difference between the liberal and radical approach is their conception of the basic unit of social change, on what is the primary social actor <clears throat> in social change. For liberals, the basic social unit is the individual. The idea is that social change happens incrementally, person by person, much like links in a chain. In this way, society is seen as simply an amorphous collection of individuals, where the sum of these individuals is still equal to the parts. Okay, well, radicals would disagree. Look at, um, for radicals, the basic unit is the group or class. This position can be seen throughout history. Take slave rebellions, for example. They aren't simply a random collection of individuals. They're a group which shares a specific oppression under a certain distribution of power. And this flows nicely into the second point between the two, idealism versus materialism. This really might be the heart of the liberal radical distinction. For liberals, social change is primarily an idealistic process. It happens in the mind. The common example we see of this is the sole focus put on education by most liberals. The argument runs, knowledge is power. If we educate the children, then they'll do the right thing, etc. Well, this is true to a certain degree. I'm here tonight to play a role in political education. But taken by itself, it leads to ridiculous conclusions. Consider one approach that has now permeated the environmental movement, that social change happens through a shift in consciousness. When 2012 comes, the planets will realign, our thought patterns will shift, and that this will lead to the end of capitalism and domination culture. I just recently saw a quote from Maya Angelou, who has done great work, but this particular quote of hers is a great illustration of this liberal perspective. She said, quote, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude, end quote. Now let's do something nifty and insert a concrete historical example. Would we ever say, if you don't like slavery, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude? No. We'd say, if you don't like slavery, change it. And if you can't change it, abolish it. And if you can't abolish it, regroup, learn from your mistakes, and try again. The point is that in the face of large oppressive systems, we cannot rely solely on attitude change. There must always be a confrontation with these systems. So throughout the culture, we find this liberal model sort of being pushed onto us. This often comes in the form of historical revisionism. Think about the way that the West has played off of Gandhi while disregarding the role of Bhagat Singh, who was the freedom fighter who led the more militant wing of the Indian resistance to British imperialism. Liberals and progressives have privileged Gandhi and his narrative so as to erase from memory the more radical aspects of the Indian resistance. And the same is true for the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. and his narrative have been privileged so as to erase from memory the more militant side of the struggle manifested by groups like the Black Panthers and the Deacons for Defense. Now, don't get me wrong. Attitudes can be a source of oppression. Harriet Tubman is quoted having said, I freed thousands of slaves. I could have freed thousands more if only they knew they were slaves. Radicals don't argue that ideas aren't important in the process of social change. Of course they are. But they do argue that they aren't the primary force of social change. The position of radicals is instead known as materialism. And it encompasses the knowledge that we're not simply oppressed because of our ideas but that there also exist concrete systems of power that facilitate our oppression and exploitation. Workers aren't exploited because they fail to identify with class interests. They're exploited because they're forced to work under capitalism, under wage labor. The same is true with women. Women aren't oppressed because they fail to recognize themselves as an autonomous group. They're oppressed because men have historically committed endless acts of violence against them as a class, because men have systematically blocked women from assuming positions of power within society. And so if you really look into the liberal position, you'll find that it bases itself on the premise that people make their choices in a vacuum. In environmentalism, this is why, again, we see so much energy put towards education, towards raising awareness. There's a significant portion of environmentalists who seem to believe that if we adequately explain the situation of things to people in positions of power, climate change, soil erosion, and so on, that they will change. Now put bluntly, I think this is an ignorant position. It ignores the reality